Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a lot of effort on the parts of a lot of people. And we do too. In fact, we prepare uh, materials that we help and stir up some conversations and discussions here at our class, and it seems to do that. Um, sometimes we even get off the subject. Amazing. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, this particular lesson is part of a series for the last three months of 2014, a series on the book of James, a very interesting series. And this particular lesson is lesson number 10 in that series entitled Weep and How. Have you ever have you ever heard of a lesson entitled Weep and How before? I mean, that's what a title. This is for December 6th of 2014, so let's see what this weeping and howling is all about. But, of course, before we start, we should offer a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we come now opening up a further portion of Scripture and seeing what we can learn from it that will bring us nearer to your kingdom. May it be so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever wished that you could win the lottery, sort of secretly. You think, well, and if I won a hundred million dollars, I could give half of it to the church, and what would I do with the other half? Would they take it? <laughs> would they take it? Uh, okay. <laughs> they would. I just asked the question. <laughs> uh, studies have shown that winning a lot of money often ruins people's lives. Why do we need money? Pay the bills, you buy a car, pay for the gas. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to com be able to com re reasonably comfortably eat and house and clothe ourselves and our families. We need money for transportation and, of course, money to support the church. We need to pay our tithes and we need to give our generous offerings. You all think of that first, right? Often the greatest happiness in life, however, does not come from money. Think of times when you have received loving words, an encouraging smile. I had a patient of mine this week that I have helped along in some various ways just send me a little note saying that her life would be as completely different if I hadn't helped her. So that, you know, it's, an, it's nice. I mean, someone says they really appreciate what you've done for them. You know, you smile to yourself and you say thank you. Unexpected kindnesses, a listening ear, warm acceptance, love, respect, a sympathetic touch, even a hug. I get hugs from my patients all the time. I'm really blessed. And genuine friendship. How much do these things cost? How much does a hug cost? Not a whole lot, generally. So it's not worth anything? Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> so, I love hugs. I get lots of nice hugs. Well, what's the most important thing in our lives? What really brings the most happiness? I'll let you think about that for a moment. We know that people, people have been willing to sacrifice even life itself just to get fame. I mean, there are people who blow themselves up so they get their name on TV. <coughs> I mean, and die. So they get the, you know, they'll do things. So they'll kill somebody else just to be known. They want to get their name. So for fame, for fortune, sometimes wealth or health, and the famous statement that I've mentioned before, the people who say, I'm going to be healthy, so help me. I'm going to practice healthy for me if it kills me. That sounds like a good motto, right? <laughs> well, think about the things that God gives us. Are those... Are those things valuable? Are they worth having? It's always nice to see a new day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're not in the obituary. God now. gives us faith. He gives us hope. He gives us wisdom, patience, love, contentment sometimes, and many other blessings. How, 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 how does God give us gifts? When my granddaughter puts her head on my shoulder and gives me a hug. Okay. Not much better than that. Not much better than that. Yeah, we, um, a week ago, in fact, a week ago yesterday, actually, I was in London with uh, my 
son and daughter-in-law and two granddaughters and and we we I had a granddaughter on my shoulder and my son had a granddaughter on his shoulder and we were walking down the street and smiling and enjoying ourselves and my daughter-in-law took a picture and my wife thinks it's just great it's the it's on her computer when she turns on the computer there we are okay so how do you find the good stuff oops I said stuff I shouldn't say stuff <laughs> You mean the stuff that God gives us, or what? The good stuff. The good. How do we find the good as opposed to the not so good, the bad, the evil? I mean, how do we? Well, uh, how does how does that? How does the knowledge of that come? I I think I I find that <coughs> the, the more we give, the more comes back to us. If you give out love, if you give out hugs, be very practical. For example. Uh, and depending on obviously your circumstances and what's going on, but if people know that you really appreciate what they do for you, what you what you do what they can do for you, then th there th it works the other way around. If you show them, thank you very much. Let me do something for you. They're going to likely do something back. Uh, Spir spiritually, uh, to follow up, he's he's talking about temporally, but spiritually. The more you give, the more you get back. The more you seek to, to do the right thing, seek God's will, and seek to implement that in your life, mm -hmm. the more he gives, you, he gives you more knowledge on how to do that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's, I think that's, you might fall into the category of growing. Mm -hmm. It does. Same thing with talents. It seems to be there's a message, a spiritual message also with talents. You give him what little you have, what or however much you have or whatever, and he's in the business of, of increasing that, yep. which some of us are afraid of that. Yeah. Because we, it's, it's, was that fall in the category of success? People say you're afraid, you're afraid of success. It took me a long time to figure out what that was, and what it meant was if you're successful, <clears throat> that means you don't have any excuses anymore. Well, you can. Let, let me let me let me let me take you give you my example. <clears throat> um, this part of California has a lot of people who are poor. A lot of people who came here illegally, who have and they're struggling, struggling, struggling to 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 meet life's necessities and so forth. So I'm part of a clinic where we're trying to reach out and help those people. And I'm sure that there are people that I take care of that I'm the most stable thing in their entire lives. They live from hand to mouth. Sometimes they're homeless. Maybe sometimes they find a place to stay for a little while. Sometimes they're staying with their kids and the next thing they know the kids are kicking them out or vice versa. That kind of stuff. And those people, they appreciate when you do something nice for them. And when you provide a service like our clinic was just bulging the seams, there's, we now know that almost a quarter of the population of these two counties here are on government insurance. Yep. A quarter of the population. It's the whole okay. other world. And if you, and what's happening now is if you provide a good service, People, you know, they come in, they always complain, we, we never can get in to see you. Why can't you get in? Too many other people want to see me. Yeah. I, had a, I had a brother-in-law who was a county treasurer for a while, and he said that 40% of the population of the particular county in which we reside is on some form of public assistance. Yeah. Well, here's what James talks about that we need to focus on today. And now I'm reading James 5, verse 1. And now, you rich people, listen to me. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. That sounds like a very appropriate Bible verse, doesn't it? Your riches have rotted away. Your clothes have been eaten by moths. means you're walking around with nakedness. you got big holes in your clothes. Your gold and silver are covered with rust, and this rust will be a witness against you, and you will eat up your, and will eat up your flesh like fire. You have piled up riches in these last days, 
you have not paid any wages to those who work on their fields and so forth and so forth. That's what we're going to talk about today. So, are these, are these verses uh, part of the prosperity gospel message? It doesn't. I don't see how it would fit in in what do they, they have to peddle. Do you hear them preaching this? No, message? I never have. I heard them preach can, about hell once. Uh, can you uh, define what you mean by the to, prosperity gospel? Well, if you're well off financially and and uh, instant wealth, instant health, and fire insurance seems to be an easy easy sale. Well, and, and I mean, look at look at the Old Testament. I mean, this is straight out of the Old Testament. People, the idea is. <clears throat> If you're doing what God wants you to do, He will bless you and you will be rich. So you can stand on the corner and you can watch. You know who the saints are when they drive by because they're driving a luxury car. And you know who the sinners are because their car is barely making it. Well, but doesn't, I mean, isn't that part of the Old Testament gospel? Doesn't, doesn't, isn't the message there that if you do right, then you will be blessed? Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 28. Mm hmm See there, there just what I said. Yep. <laughs> so Martin Luther <laughs> says this is a book of straw, right? Well, so now you're going to condemn my book. <laughs> Let me read you a couple, <laughs> couple of verses. By the way, one time I memorized the book of James from the King James Version back when I was in high school. Still remember it? I could, I could come up with it pretty quick. I mean, a little reviewing. Oh, really Look at James 1, 10, and 11. And the rich Christians must be glad when God brings them down, for the rich will pass away like the flower of a wild plant. The sun rises with its blazing heat and burns the plant. Its flower falls off and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will be destroyed while they go about their businesses. Now, you were mentioning that there was, what, 25% of the population in, the, in, some, in government insurance and all these people that come in through your clinic and so forth. But I have insurance, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty happy with it. And uh, I have an income, and I have a retirement mm -hmm. plan, so this, this doesn't sound like it's, it likes me very well. You well, know, is there... Is Sounds is there like a I'm problem? I don't quite see the problem he's dealing it dealing well, with here, because no. if if he saw Abraham, would he say the same thing to him? Yeah. And well, or would if he saw any of those guys, he saw Lot. If he saw um, Job, Job, yeah. would he say the same thing to him? That's one of the questions. What we do know is this. Let's quote Jesus himself, Luke seventeen. Same subject. Everybody kept on eating and drinking, and men and women married up to the point up to the very day Noah went into the boat and the flood came and killed them all. It will be as it was in the time of Lot, you just mentioned. Everybody kept on eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. On the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and killed them all. That is how it will be on the day of the Son of Man, this day the Son of Man is revealed. Now, is, is that, that is that likely to happen in our time? Is that a, is that a condemnation about that activity, or is that just simply saying life is going to kind of be going along and you're going to be caught off guard? <clears throat> what that's saying is that if your life is completely consumed by the everyday activities, partying and 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 getting the most gusto out of life, and you could care less about God, then that's what it's talking about. The interesting thing is this, that word that talks about the miseries that are going to come upon the rich, it's found somewhere else in the Bible, you know where? <coughs> Revelation 3.17, and I quote, you say I'm rich and well off, I have, need of, uh, I have all I need, but you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. Guess what word that is? You are poor, naked, and blind. I advise you to then to going on to buy from me gold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So maybe is this talking about material things or is it talking about spiritual things? Well, that's usually interpreted to to mean spiritual things. <clears throat> this means that you uh, are we rich in spiritual things? <clears throat> you know, I consider myself to be. It's uh, a combination, what, isn't it? What's Jesus talking about? Blessed are the poor in spirit. I'm, oh. I'm sitting here tonight. This is pretty rich. Yeah. 
And I can tell you, I had this little tiny computer. I can pick it up and stick it under my arm without any problem at all. And I have about 4,500 Christian books in this computer. 4,500 books, including all the writings of Ellen White, about, I don't know how many, two or three hundred Bible translations in this little tiny computer. How, I mean, what more could I ask for? And the bulk of those you don't need. <laughs> you, 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 could, you could get it right out of here, out of one book. But, yeah. mm -hmm. It's nice to have the others, yeah. but uh, also we want to remember that most of those other books don't have the great controversy point of view. Mm -hmm. And so you, we, majority of the people will get a distorted perception of, of what is truth. How was that for a little condemnation there, talking about how rich you are <laughs> yeah, with you things go. you don't need in there? Yeah. <coughs> It, well, <clears throat> I was going to say, isn't it a con there's nothing wrong with wealth? It's the attitude and how you got it there, uh -huh. and, and what you've done with it. Well, yeah. verse, look at on to verse four. Behold, the wages of the laborers who <laughs> mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So Most cry. of the people that, that do that, they don't get really rich without taking advantage of somebody down uh, on the f f lower That's rungs of the ladder. It's exactly the way I feel every time I pay for one of Bill Gates' computer licenses, software licenses. Yeah, well, that, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> relatively, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. <laughs> well, the word wretched there, which is teliparos in Greek, miserable, whatever you want to call it, from James and from John in the book of Revelation, could mean Worn out from hard labor. Does any of that ever happen to us? Well, certainly would have been what's mentioned there. Well, don't we think that the Laodicean message applies to us in the Seventh Day Adventist Church in yeah. 2014? I think it does. We hear sermons about it all the time. Not much anymore. I haven't heard much anymore <laughs> either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well, like there, are some, <laughs> there are three people the lesson mentions that have interesting implications about them. Nabal. What do we know about Nabal? He had a piece of property. And what else Abraham, did Abraham, excuse me, Ahab wanted. And his wife told him, go no, take that, it. You're, you're, Am you're, I getting you're mixed up? You're thinking of a different one. This is David. Oh, and I'm thinking of Naboth. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nabal. What about Nabal? Well, David. Nabal, Nabal had a beautiful wife. Yeah. He had huge flocks and herds. And David, not really having anything else to do, because he was running away from Saul, helped to protect his flocks out there against thieves and marauders, and et cetera, et cetera. If it, hadn't, if it hadn't been for David and his men, <clears throat> Nabal might not have had those things because That's David right. was running around there protecting them from... Yes. And when it came time for <coughs> harvesting and, 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 you know, shearing the sheep and maybe sacrificing some animals, why, uh, David said, how about sharing a little bit? And Nabal says, who are you? Get out of here! And this was... I mean, David was, uh, and his men, his band, they were, uh, they, they were roaming people. They did not have flocks. That's the way they... They, they certainly could have helped themselves <coughs> to Nabal's flocks, and he would not have been able to do anything about it. Also, just, just in passing, was, was this also a bit of a custom? You know, like um, when the children of Israel went through lands, or I was thinking somewhere along the line it was part of the part of the culture that you were supposed to kind of take care of people like this. Maybe, yeah. I, maybe I've wandered. Well, here. you're right. You're right. <coughs> and another one. What about Hezekiah? He had a lot of wealth. What, what did he do with his wealth? He showed it off. Yeah, he showed it off to the Babylonians who a little while later decided they needed it, right? Mm -hmm. Then there was someone else who had a little different financial situation. What about Peter in Acts chapter 3? Remember that verse? One day Peter and John, I'm reading from three, Acts 3 verse 1, One day Peter and John went to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hour for prayer. There at the beautiful gate, as it was called, was a man who had been lame all his life. Every day he was carried to the gate to beg for money from the people who were going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John going in, he begged them to give him something. 
They looked straight at him and Peter said, out of my vast wealth, I will share a few pennies, right? No. Peter said, look at us. So he looked at them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said to him, I have no money at all. <coughs> but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I order you to get up and walk. And what happened? He got up and walked. In fact, he didn't just walk. He leaped and he bounded and he into the temple and he was so excited and got Peter and John into trouble, didn't he? Well, why is it that some people seem to be get, getting richer and richer and others seem poorer and poorer? <coughs> well, some people, are, some people are wise and know how to generate wealth, and there are others who <coughs> don't seem to I, have that ability. I had the very unusual privilege at one point of... Um, <coughs> welcoming into my home a gentleman who had quite a history. I, I don't have time to begin to tell his story, but he was an American, and at one point in time he was in head of a large American company serving in Germany, so he got to speak, he, 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 well, I think he even learned as a child, could speak fluent German, did business there. And after World War II, this gentleman was picked out by the U.S. government to go and help organize the Marshall Plan to restore Europe. And he was sent to Germany because he had this, you know, good knowledge of business and a good knowledge of German and so forth. And one evening, after he'd been there for a little while and people were there from other nations trying to figure out all, all these different groups were getting together, how, how are we going to rebuild this nation? There was, the money wasn't worth anything, the economy was totally ruined, the buildings had all been blasted out, etc. And so, what do you do? You know? So he, they all got together in his house one evening, and they said, what are we going to do? How are we going to start? And they said, big, long discussion. I won't go into all the details. But at the end of that evening, they said, we're going to create a new currency. We're going to call it the Deutschmark. And the Deutschmark was invented in his living room. Yeah. And he said, you know what happened? You all can guess what happened. They decided, okay, there's no way to reconstruct the bank records. There's no way to go back and say, okay, you're supposed to have this much, you're supposed to have this much. That's impossible. So they said, we're just going to arbitrarily give every p person who can prove that they're a German citizen 40 Deutschmarks, and we'll see what happens. It wasn't very long but before there were a lot of people who had almost nothing, and there were other people who had hundreds of Deutschmarks. That's the way it is. That's the way it is in human society. So we don't have to worry too much about people having a lot and some who don't have so much because everybody gets what they deserve. Well, here in James it says those rich people are going to weep, be going to be weeping and howling. What's going to make them weep and howl? Well, isn't there a key part of being honest or not in this? Yeah. It looks like there's some evidence that he's... He's pointing at people that are dishonest and getting their wealth that way. Yeah. In a major way. So, and but, Psalm but, 73 and other, other places that are mentioned in the lesson say, God is going to deal with these people. So should we just sit back and say, if I'm having a hard time financially, God will fix those characters. Is that what we're supposed to do? Well, yes, but when I read that, I have a little vengeance in my heart. God's going to get even with these people and he's going to take all their money away. Is that really what's going to happen? You well, know, it I, seems like I know an awful lot of, become aware of an awful lot of people that sure seem awful evil to me. And man, they have had millions and millions for years. I mean, take, exa take for example, the big drug dealers. How does God get even with these people? Well, hmm? does he get even with them? Yeah. I think so. In the end. They get left behind when the second yeah. coming happens. Right. But l let's take another example. In approximately 605 B.C., before Christ, there was a prophet by the name of Habakkuk. And he said, and he saw the Babylonians coming. 
and he saw them. We don't know exactly where, at what time. He doesn't give us any specifically datable events in his book, but either just before or maybe even just after the Babylonians have completely conquered Jerusalem and hauled off Daniel and his friends and others like that. And, and Habakkuk says, God, why are you letting all this evil stuff happen? And what does God say? You're not going to believe what's going to happen after this. Watch me. And then he ends up with these incredible verses, the last three verses in the book of Habakkuk. Let me read these. Now think about this. We're talking about people who are subsistence farmers. What do we mean when we say a subsistence farmer? Day to day. It means they eat what they raise on their property or what their animals produce or something like that. That's what they have, okay? At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's gone. <laughs> Even though the fig trees have no fruit, I'm reading Habakkuk 3, verse 17 and following, and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no corn, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty. And what happens if you're a subsistence farmer at that point? You die. I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my Savior. The Sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountains. Wow. How could you rejoice at that point? You know, we, we intimated just a moment ago that this justice is going through these, for these injustices is going to come about, you know, when judgment comes. But I, th I think it's more immediate than that. I, I, think we, I think when we seek to amass, let's say, we're talking about money here, mm -hmm. amass a lot of money, we're seeking... We're doing that to satisfy some inner need, some inner happiness, some inner satisfaction. And I think the justice comes one way or the other for that. When, when if that's what you look for, you're not going to find that inner satisfaction. You're going to uh, just get that inner joy. You've spent all your time doing this, and the justice is that you've looked in the wrong place, and you know you're not really you're missing it. Whereas in Habakkuk's case, mm -hmm. I think the message is, um, could be interpreted slightly different. Uh, it didn't make any difference how much Habakkuk had or who he's talking to here. There was something deep inside. There was this satisfaction of this, this inner connection. With God. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, when a person goes after money, Mm -hmm. his, isn't his world kind of a little bit narrow? <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're going in to get money, and of course, you know, you, you can always get food out of it, you can always get shelter, you can always get this, that, and the other thing, all your needs. But maybe that just kind of gets old after a while. It doesn't, it doesn't have the satisfaction well, mm -hmm. that they think it's going to have, and after a while, Life just gets old, and when it does, that is the judgment that gets poured on them. I mean, just there's, because of that. Plenty of people have said that collecting money works by the laws of diminishing returns. When you add, when you, when you go from having, let's say, one dollar to having a couple hundred dollars or something like that, and you're easy, a little easier to supply the needs of today and tomorrow, maybe this week, and you feel comfortable. That's a huge deal. When you go from, you know, I don't know what, fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, does it really make all that much difference? You might feel a little more comfortable, but the it's increment kind of a mirage yeah. that people chase after mm -hmm. and. Um, well, are there gross injustices in our world that we need to be dealing with as Christians? Sure. Well, is it the way you want to look? Just about. Mm -hmm. Is the context though of that question is that within people trying to make money? Un That's one of the injustices. We know that people. There are many parts of the world right now where people are being killed because of what they believe. Well, then how about like drug dealers, mm -hmm. uh, people like that who, who you know, make money off of this 
this this problem. Mm -hmm. you know? When you say gross injustices that we we need to do something about, that is gross and there's so many gross injustices. I this I can't I can't deal I with with them all. So we suggested last week that there there's no way we're going to resolve all those problems before Jesus comes. So and I could even take one of those gross injustices mm -hmm. and. And, and, what may, and make what would appear to be, on the immediate sense, a very small impact. Mm -hmm. So, how do I, I mean, in answer to that question, how do I, how do I answer that question? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a, yeah, that's a, what, what, well, James, yeah, go ahead. So it's like the widow's might. Yeah. It's the attitude that goes with it. God worries mm -hmm. about the rest of it. <coughs> yeah. Well, um, Jesus clearly talked about, I mean, how much wealth did Jesus have? He's dirt poor. Just his robe. He had some friends, some really good friends, mm -hmm. and they seemed to take care of him. And James here talks about getting wealth in bad ways, right? Um, look, at, look, at, look at James 5. We, look, we looked at a couple of these verses. What about verse 3? Your gold and silver are covered with rust, and this rust will be a witness against you and will eat up your f flesh like fire. You have piled up riches in these last days. What's he trying to tell us? Is there a time right now when the money we have available could be used profitably for God's work. And maybe sometime in the future when it'll be too late and that money will just rot. So are you intimating that I need to clean out my retirement fund? I'm asking you. The question is, will, 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 our, will our money sometimes, someday be a, a witness against us? That's what, that's what James says. Well, I always wonder about people who they really have faith in, and and this is this is even come back on me, whether I have more faith in my bank account or I have faith in God. Well, here's here's keeping. the verse, Luke twelve verse thirty three: Sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. Provide for yourselves purses that don't wear out. Save your riches in heaven where they will never decrease, because no thief can get to them. And no moth can destroy them. Well, that was because they thought Jesus was coming right away. And we don't think that? Well, they did back then. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Uh -huh. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't look quite that imminent. But. I see. <laughs> what, what's our true attitude toward money as Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Are we, are we just as anxious or just as busy hoarding it as the rest of the world? Depends who you talk to. Yeah. I think we've gotten too used to it always being there, and that comes mm -hmm. down to trust in the money, and I'm not too sure that's going to stay around a whole lot longer here and now. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember a pastor, a sermon a pastor preached, and I don't remember what the sermon was all about. I just remember him telling about this lady, this was back in the 60s, um, early 60s, about this lady that he went to visit and she wanted, she called him to come and she had some money to give to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, she had no indoor plumbing. Mm. And he said, sister, why don't you keep this money and, and you know, get, get yourself some indoor plumbing. And she said, they're building a new hospital out in Loma Linda, and they need this money. So, <clears throat> is that, should she have kept that money? And they got enough money out here to build this hospital without her 120 bucks probably back then or whatever? Or... I mean, 
what we can say about that, all, all I can possibly say about something like that is, she showed where her heart was. Remember what, it come, what Jesus said? Your treasure, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, the Bible is pretty clear about how God feels about people who withhold wages from their laborers. Um, we read James 5, verse 4. Actually, let me, let me read a couple of other places. Look at Deuteronomy 24, verses 14 to 15. Do not cheat poor and needy hired servants, whether fellow Israelites or foreigners living in one of your towns. Each day before sunset, Pay them for that day's work. They need the money and have counted on getting it. If you do not pay them, they will cry out against you to the Lord and you will be guilty of sin. Isn't that pretty clear? Well, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> I see. Well, how many of those early Christians that James was writing to actually worked for wages which they needed to feed their families? Probably, yeah, any idea? Probably quite a lot. Well, a lot of it wasn't... A lot of people just bartered yeah. some of the stuff. It isn't just money. I mean, some of the slaves actually lived with their, their um, owners. In, in rural Africa, when we were there about 20, 30 years ago, basically the wives and the kids would tend to stay home and grow the food that the family needed in the local plot, their, their, their backyard. Mm -hmm. The husband would go to town and try to find a job to buy a few of the other necessities that they couldn't produce on their own plot. Mm -hmm. So, what do you say to groups like that? Ellen White said these words, this is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 682, Riches bring with them great responsibilities. Mm -hmm. To obtain wealth by unjust dealing, by overreaching in trade, by oppressing the widow and the fatherless, or by hoarding up riches and neglecting the wants of the needy, will eventually bring the just retribution described by the inspired apostle, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. And of course she's quoting our verse. One of our verses for this week. You know, one thing, um, you know, that family you were just talking about, you know, that the, the wife and the mm -hmm. son, you know, stayed at home while the father went out and worked. Now, if I knew those people and they had a fire and their, their shack burned down or something like that, I would be a lot more inclined helping them than I would a guy on the street that says, well, we'll work for food. Just because I know those mm -hmm. people, and you know for sure that they're in need, and you know they're not really taking advantage of anybody. They, they actually need something. So Should am I, am I do, is that a good attitude to have, or let should let I just give money to everybody? Let me expand on that. Is it, is it a better idea for us to help other church members than in the guy on the corner of the street, to expand your point? Well, I, I remember one guy that said, I will work for food, will work for food, um, out there getting his money. And another guy came that I work with came in. He said he saw that guy at Taco Bell, and he pulled out a big old wad of money and paid mm. for his taco. Mm. So um, he's probably doing all right. He's doing all right. <laughs> He's going to have a day of reckoning down the line, too, just like this. Well, that's true. But it, it just, to me, I, f I feel a lot better by, by going with the family than the guy that yeah. just comes out of nowhere and wanting money. Well, Ellen White had some very strong words to say about some, a couple that were Adventists way back when. Volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 238. Look at these words. What do you think about this? In trading with the merchants at, and she leaves that blank, brother and sister blank, did not take a course which is pleasing to God. They will dicker to get things as cheap as they possibly can and linger over a difference of a few pennies and talk in regard to it as though money was their all their God. 
if they could only be brought back unobserved to hear the remarks that are made after they leave, they would get a clearer idea of the influence of penuriousness. Do we know what penuriousness is? Yeah, the modern medium is they squeak when they walk. <laughs> Penny pinching. Yeah. Our faith is brought into disrepute. Our faith is brought into disrepute and God is blasphemed by someone accounted this close penny dealing. Angels turn away in disgust. Everything in heaven is noble and elevated. All seek that, the interest and happiness of others. No one devotes himself to looking out and caring for self. It is the chief joy of all holy beings to witness the joy and happiness of those around them. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I went to a teacher's convention some years ago, it was a denominational teachers' convention, and they, uh, which they paid for most of the expenses, and they gave us a little allowance, and they mentioned part of that allowance was for tipping, uh -huh. because they said <clears throat> that I think it was at the last general conference that the, <laughs> the cab drivers were saying these Adventists they came in with the Ten Commandments in one hand and a ten dollar bill in the other, and they never broke either one. <laughs> so, you know, when when you think of, when you think about it, uh, you know, you got you paying out ten percent tithe and and another bunch for for church uh, expense, and you got tuition and all of this stuff, and you only have uh, five days, five, six days to work. Everybody else has got seven. <laughs> you know, you. you, Boy, you're, you you can you can get to where things are you know we have we have parents at school who both parents work and on the weekends you know they're selling tacos and stuff to pay for the tuition and so uh i don't are we a little are we not as generous as we ought to be are we are we you know is, well, we'll that, is keep, that us up there we'll on the dancing thing? around that question you know the story of the rich man and lazarus Look at this interesting note about that rich and poor person, those two people, as in, our, as in our Bible study guide. Contrary to popular opinion, the real focus, by the way, this is in the section, I think it's Thursday, it's page 84 in, the, in your Bible study guide. Contrary to popular opinion, the real focus of the parable, this is the rich man and Lazarus, is this life, not the afterlife. In fact, the original Greek makes no mention of heaven or hell at all. Both the rich man and Lazarus are depicted in the same place, verse 23, the grave or Hades. The chasm separating them symbolizes the fact that after a person dies, his or her eternal destiny is fixed. Therefore, how we treat people in this life, as described in Moses and the prophets, verses 29 and 31, is extremely important. There is no future life in which we can make up for what we fail to do in this one. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 84. Well, what do you think about that? In light of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I think it's true. You think it's true? Yeah. And we all uh, end up, we enter this world in similar situations and we leave in similar situations. You came in naked and you leave naked, huh? Pretty mm -hmm. much. Okay, moving on. We don't have much time left. James 5, verse 6. You have condemned and murdered innocent people and they do not resist you. What does that mean? This is, this is, you know, you, you keep reading this stuff, um, uh, this material, mm -hmm. um, that's describing these type of rich people. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think there's a specific class that he had in mind. It's, I'm not quite sure if the problem is being rich, but how, what they do to gather it. Yeah, 
I mean, their attitude toward money, in other words? Well, we know what happens. Murderers claim self-defense. Sexual abusers blame the behavior of the victim as enticing them. Husbands and wives blame each other for failed marriages. Even those who killed Christian martyrs blame the martyrs for heresy. Will the day come when those who kill Seventh-day Adventists believe they are doing God's will? Yeah. Absolutely. Do we Does, doesn't ICE, don't those of ISIS think they are doing yeah. the right thing? Do Most we, of them anyway? Yes. Do we sometimes do things that we believe are right only to discover later that they are the wrong things? Oh, we know they could already have shot a few Adventists mm -hmm. in those lands. What about the Adventists that killed people thought they were doing the right thing? I'm thinking of Rwanda. Yeah. Pretty bad. I've been in the church where hundreds of Adventists were killed. On Sabbath morning. Yes. They did it. Remember Matthew 5.39, talking about how should we respond to some of these things? But now I tell you, do not take revenge on someone who wrongs you. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, let him slap the left cheek too. Now, people don't go around slapping people on the cheek today. So what is, does this mean this verse no longer applies to us? It applies. It does. How? Well, it can be financial, for instance. You can have money or, or, or somebody makes you a loan and you don't pay it back. Or you're very late in paying it back and the other party goes broke and they're looking for food. I mean, this kind mm -hmm. of thing happens all the time. You know, I used to see these dramas, like these old television dramas, these old westerns where, where they'd have the character turn the other cheek all the time and people would beat up on them. And somebody, mm -hmm. some friend would say, come on, you got to stick up for yourself. If you don't do something, they just keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And they keep doing that. And the whole drama is built around that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what would you have told those people as far as, because they obviously, they read that. Turn the other cheek and don't fight back. And that's the Lord's will. And the other people who were inflicting the injuries were reading an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Oh, I think they were just bullies. They were just having all kinds of fun because of it. But. Well, Deuteronomy 8 through 11 says, God gives us the ability to make wealth, to, to produce wealth. And I quote, now again, this is Ellen White. Uh, she quotes that verse here in Christ Lesson, page 351, paragraph 3 and 352. And it says, money has great value. We hope that's true. Because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. Is that what happens to money in our hands? It is a defense for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand, only as it is, de is put to use in providing for the necessities of life, in blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. Hoarded wealth is not merely useless, it is a curse. In this life it is a snare to the soul, drawing the affections away from the easy, I'm sorry, from the heavenly treasure. In the great day of God, it's, it's witness to unused talents and neglected opportunities will condemn its possessor. The scripture says, and then the passage we read, read from James 5, 1 and 4, then she goes on, but Christ sanctions no lavish or careless use of means. His lessons, his lesson in economy, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost, is for all his followers, John 6, 12. He who, he who realizes that his money is a talent from God will use it economically and will feel it as a duty to save that he may give. Christ taught you lessons 351, 352. Is this largely what James is addressing here, is hoarding? Yeah. Well, you know, I'd been involved with some fundraising, and it seemed like the people that I was with to raise money for, they weren't really all that, what's the word, kind of um, 
I was going to say sexy, but that isn't a very good thing. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, you know, we go to some people and ask them for a little bit of money, but it seems like they could still put out tons of money for some big thing that, that makes a big splash somewhere. And it seemed like that whole bunch of money just, you know, didn't pan out to do anything. That means and yet they were, the, mm -hmm. yet they were doing it for, for some personal reason besides just giving it to the Lord. It just seems like. Let me give you an example. Lumberland University and a lot of other hospitals in Southern California have been told that there are certain standards for earthquake preparedness. They have to be in place, I think, by 2020. And. There was an evaluation of our hospital out here, our nice hospital, and it was determined that it would be cheaper to build a brand new hospital than to earthquake fit the one we've got now. So now you've got to raise, by the time we get done completely replacing the facilities over here, something like $1.2 billion with a B. Well, and my brother has some responsibility for that kind of stuff, as you know head of this institution, got together with a bunch of his friends and said, we need to approach some of the people around here who have money and see what they will do. They went and talked to someone who has lived their whole life in this area and made very good money and said, we think you can give about $80 million. And the guy says, well, let me think about it. And a little while later, he came and says, I, I think building a new hospital at Loma Linda is a great project. I'd like to give $100 million. It's in the paper. What would you say? Well, I hope it turns out to be a good hospital. <laughs> That's well, what I'd say. <laughs> I, you, we can, I, I've had some real experiences recently. You, you may know that, maybe you don't, uh, recently there was a report in uh, a national news magazine Atlantic Weekly, I believe, they sent out a team to evaluate how, pe how satisfied are people with their jobs when they graduate from health professions. And they went around, the, around this country and asked people from a whole bunch of institutions. So you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a um, PT or whatever like that. And it turned out that the students who are graduated from Lumley University had the highest job satisfaction of any institution in this country. Why do you suppose that is? Maybe because they weren't, hopefully they're not working just for money. Yeah. Well, I can relate a story that was told to me. I don't have all the details, but there was a girl that was admitted to the hospital here from one of our desert community hospitals. and. Her parents were from the East Coast, wealthy. Mm -hmm. She came here, she died because they couldn't figure out prior to her being admitted here uh, what the problem was. It turned out to be a congenital problem. The parents just recently were so thankful to Loma Linda because they expected to take her back to Mass General or someplace back there, a big hospital that was well known and nice facilities. They didn't want her to come to Loma Linda. And they said they were blown away by the care that she got here. And it was not the facilities. It was the people. The people. I recently, well, about a year ago, was working sort of hand in glove with a, a very good nurse, a very good nurse, which I could recommend to anybody, and I did. For, for various reasons, she moved away from here. And now she's working in a non-Christian hospital. And she says, oh, I wish I could be back working with you. She, I just talked to her a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. I'm now working with people that don't care about anything. They use foul language. They're very rough on their patients and so forth. She wishes she were back here. Anyway, we've got, there's a couple of points we've got to talk about before we get to the end of this, we know the story of Zacchaeus. Maybe James should have recommended that all those rich people do what Zacchaeus did. 
How would that be? What would James say to the Laodiceans that we read about in Revelation 3? Well, I'm going to come down to the bottom line here. If the wealth which we hold not only materially but also spiritually has been given to us by God, what are we doing to share that wealth? Are we sharing our spiritual wealth as well as our material wealth? How are we sharing our spiritual wealth? Could we do it better? Are we, are we honestly described by the passage in Revelation 3? But that doesn't apply to us, right? Are we rich and increased with goods? We certainly wouldn't go around telling people that we are, would we? In relation to probably <coughs> three quarters of the world we are. Well, they're, ha they're happy when I hand out money, but they're not happy when I hand out my spiritual wealth. <laughs> Would you say, fair enough, I understand that. Would you say that those of us in a situation like those around this table here now have at our disposable more spiritual wealth than any other group of people ever in the history of this world? Yeah, no question. We have the Bible and translations, whatever language you want, any translation you want. If you're not happy with one, a whole bunch more. We have all the writings of Ellen White. I have all of her writings in several different versions here in my computer, talking about my little computer here. I mean, I can look any of that stuff up. I can find it, put it down on the handouts we prepared for people to study the Sabbath school lessons. But we have an enormous wealth. I think the question is, uh, not do we... Wealth means you, that you possess it. Just mm -hmm. because it's available doesn't mean you possess it. Yes, that's true. What are we doing? What are we doing to share our spiritual wealth? Now, we're, we're, we're on TV here trying to share our spiritual wealth. We're running out of, fa of, of time here. We have prepared a lot of material of spiritual wealth on our website at theox.org, T-H-E-O-X.org. Have a look for yourself. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share what we have with others. May it be a blessing to them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.